technology, right? Um, well, Max, thanks a bunch, man. I really appreciate the intro. And, and as he was saying, um, yeah, definitely have, have spent quite a few uh, years with Max in the trenches, um, as well as kind of, you know, beside him and, and dealing with education and just design in general. And, and so really appreciate you inviting me back and, and definitely excited to kind of give a little bit of perspective to these guys. And, and as you said, I mean, everything is, is so different now. <laughs> so um, again, we'll, we'll make the best of tonight. And again, hopefully I can share a couple of uh, at least tidbits of information with you guys and some visuals that might inspire you. And um, I guess we'll just kind of get into it. So I'm gonna share my screen with you guys here. So basically what we titled this was the refinement of design. So again, what I want to kind of go through and talk about tonight is a little bit of process um, as well as some of my experiences kind of through growing up, through getting into college, through being in college, getting out into the real world of design, and then eventually kind of starting my own consultancy. And uh, basically I, I I, I want to start with history, right? As, as I kind of just mentioned. So I, I have this little saying where it's, you know, if you know where you came from, it's easier to tell where you're going. So there was actually this exercise, you know, as Max said that I, I taught for a couple of years, the senior studio class, and I've gone back and done demo series for Photoshop and illustration techniques. And again, I, I, I'm glad to give back to you guys. You guys are the future of design. You guys are the next generation. So it excites me to at least hopefully inspire one or two of you guys tonight, hopefully more. Um, but kind of leading back into the statement here, I, I used to do this exercise with my students when I was teaching, where basically I would have everyone get up and tell their story, right? What's your story of design? How did you get into design? And I think it's always interesting to, to really get a sense of, you know, people's history. Um, so a little bit of kind of my history was that I was raised in a creative household. My mom was always constantly doing watercolor paintings, um, crafting, just kind of always doing something that if, you know, she couldn't buy it, she would make it herself. Um, always entertaining, you know, putting together these huge spreads on the dining room table and holidays were like her favorite time of year because she could just go all out. Um, so that kind of led me into, uh, my father was actually a construction management, uh, consultant and he had his own business for a lot of years. So I was always seeing blueprints and I was always being a part on walking jobs with him and just getting to see construction and things being built. And I always thought that was just so amazing. And so that kind of inspired me to look into architecture initially. And I think a lot of students, maybe not all, but back in the day, I know a lot of my kind of colleagues were, oh, I want to be an architect. But then we realized very quickly by, I worked in a consultancy and very quickly they uninspired me to become an architect just because of the schooling and then to become a certified architect and then to actually get your own practice to really become a known you know, architect that's really doing design. So I guess I could, should kind of thank them because that's what you know, pushed me into um, industrial design. So kind of fast forwarding to high school career day. Uh, I think I might be one of, if very few, you know, of those success stories from a high school career day. Um, and it was actually my best friend at the time, uh, learned about industrial design. And so he's actually one that told me about it. So I said, oh, cool. Like we have this guy coming to do industrial design at career day. So I'll, let's go check it out. And so uh, first thing we go into the classroom, there was a couple other ones. I did architecture, I did business, like financial consulting or something like that. And then the last one was this industrial design one. So we hopped in, we sat down, guy in the front of the classroom had just reams and reams of sketch notebooks. He had a couple of scale models. He had all kinds of just interesting looking things. Well, as he's talking and as he's going through his process, um, he tells us where he works. We'll come to find out it was frog design. So frog design is a huge, you know, multinational, you know, design consultancy up in the Bay Area. And they do stuff with Apple. They do stuff with Google. They do stuff with all the major players. So seeing these sketches and seeing these scale models, it just, I remember looking at it and just thinking to myself, like, that's what I want to do. I, I found in that moment that that's what I wanted to do. So then fast forward to graduation. So I applied to Cal State, got in, in the industrial design you know, department. Um, so I was a freshman coming out of, of high school and just kind of got into the program. And my first couple of years were, were touchy. They were a little, you know, touch and go. I, I wasn't super focused and wasn't super disciplined. 
Um, but when I finally got into the program, I, I was fortunate enough to get in on my first application. It was way different back then, by the way, than what you guys go through. Um, and so it, it, it's just a, it, the program has evolved and I know there's a lot more students and all that stuff, but it was uh, not to say that's not cutthroat now, but it was, it was very cutthroat back then. Um, and I just remember, you know, just hours and hours and hours of times being spent putting our portfolios together and so scared and so nervous as I know you guys were or are going to be um, when you guys go up for portfolio review. So fortunate enough, I got in, get into the junior studio, and then finally it kind of kicked me in the ass. So I was like, ooh, I kind of got like, to focus. And like, I got to you know, put together some better presentations and better work and so on and so forth. So it was actually at the end of my junior semester, um, there was an email that went out and it was about an internship. And it was an internship with Faulkner Design Development there in Newport Beach, and it was for footwear design. And mind you, I was the kid that played water polo and swam in high school, so I was wearing flip-flops almost every day of the year at Cal State, even when it rained out. I mean, I remember slipping on some of that concrete on upper campus wearing flip-flops um, just because that's what I was so used to wearing. So anyways, this footwear consultancy, you know, internship comes along, and I was like, oh, I'm going to apply. Like, that sounds cool. Footwear sounds like a cool industry to get into. So I applied and I remember I wasn't good at digital sketching. That's really was their huge requirement was this um, Photoshop and Illustrator, you know, skills are a must. And so basically I, I kind of worked, you know, my tail off used, I borrowed a Wacom tablet from one of my buddies. Again, I don't even know if you guys use Wacom tablets anymore. It's all iPad and, you know, um, Cintiqs and stuff. So I borrowed his Wacom and was able to put together a couple of kind of sketches and renderings that were digital. And so I took that in with me to the, inter uh, the interview. And long story short, I, I got the internship. And I remember his words point blank to me when I was, you know, getting ready to leave the interview. And it was, he looked at me and he's like, I can tell you're nervous. And I just said, yeah, I, what I did is nowhere close to what you guys are presenting. And so he said, that's okay. He's like, we're going to teach you. And he's like, and I'll tell you something more. He said, when you go back to your studio at the end of this summer internship, he's like, your classmates are going to hate you. And I kind of just chuckled and I looked at him and I was like, what do you mean by that? And he basically just said, you know, the skills you're going to learn here and the process of design is going to set you drastically ahead of your classmates. So that just got me pumped even more and then just lit more of a fire underneath my ass to just put work and push harder. So spent a ton of late nights at the internship, just going through files, looking at other renderings, looking at other designs, just getting inspired, trying to work on things and, and hone my skill and my craft. And I remember when I went back for a semester senior year, our first presentation, everyone else was putting up, you know, pencil and pen sketches. And I threw up like eight Photoshop renderings and literally the two or three top guys in the class at that point you know, basically looked at me and like, well, where'd you learn how to do this? You know, and, and it was just, it was a great validation to my skills that I worked hard to gain that I was challenging these top guys in the class. So from that internship, which I highly recommend all of you guys go out and get as soon as you can, even if it's like a grunt work internship, being surrounded by design, being surrounded by skill sets that are outside your comfort zone is just drastically, drastically important. Um, so I, I highly encourage you guys to do that when and, and as soon as you can. And so uh, fast forward through senior year, um, I get towards the end of it. I still worked at the internship and basically um, I was just getting, you know, professional design level, you know, feedback. And when we had to make prototypes and models and mockups, I got to use the, you know, professional equipment at the shop. So I was very, very fortunate my senior year to continue to work there. And then even more fortunate that, you know, a, a month or so, a couple weeks before senior show, um, they, you know, my boss came down and sat in my, you know, little computer area and basically said, hey, you know, at, at you know, professional, I don't want you to talk to anyone else. And I said, well, what do you mean? He's like, well, I want to hire you. And I said, that's awesome. Like, let's do it. Let's make it happen. So very fortunate again to have had an offer before I even graduated um, because I know a couple of my classmates really struggled to get a job outside of, of you know, college. And, and we were just before kind of the, the economy crashing in that 08, 09. I graduated 07. And so um, was, was very fortunate. And I look back on that as, as really kind of the, the, obviously the start of my design career, but what really pushed me into where I am now as a designer. So I worked there for about seven years, and then it was when I turned 30. Um, I basically just told myself by the time I, or when I turned 30, um, that I was gonna have something of my own. I didn't know what that meant. It could have been my own brand. It could have been my own consulting business. It could have been whatever. 
Um, it was just a, a goal I set for myself. And I remember I had that conversation with my boss at the time and um, he, he basically, you know, was upset and, and said, you know, you're so young, that's so young, but it's just, you know, a, a deal I made with myself. And so I actually was fortunate to continue to work part-time while I was kind of growing and building my client base and getting new projects and working on new things. Um, and he was also paying my health insurance still. So I was very, very fortunate in that regard. Um, cause that, you know, all those costs just add up, especially when you're trying to start a business. So, uh, fast forward after maybe three quarters of a year or a year of doing that, working part-time with him and then gaining my own clients. Um, we finally kind of cut ties just, you know, he said it was time and, and I had enough clientele that to continue doing work on my own. So for the past six years, um, I've been consulting and doing my own business and, you know, we work with everyone from startups, you know, in the soft goods industry, all the way up to uh, Epson, you know, is a huge client of ours. And we're doing design strategy, design research, and kind of concept design for them. So it's kind of everything from soft goods, uh, soft goods to consumer electronics, um, to graphic design, to just design strategy and design research. So we're kind of a full service consultancy in that regard. We like to say, I guess, a creative agency. Um, and so I wanted to kind of just go over kind of the mission statement with you guys. Um, and this is, this is from kind of our company. This is what we've kind of come up with. And basically it just says that, you know, as creative specialists, we seek to use our informed intuition and intelligence for beauty to create meaningful experiences for our clients and the users of their products. It is our ultimate goal that the volume of these experiences span the lifetime of the products and leave the consumer wanting more from the brand. So, <clears throat> Yep. So what is process? Um, basically, what we think of and how I want to, I guess, kind of explain it to you guys. And again, this try to keep this as casual of a conversation as, as possible. Um, but it's, it's the execution of thoughtful design while practicing good design judgment. Again, this is something that I would constantly tell my students when I was teaching with them. And this has kind of come from my, at now, culmination of 13 years of experience and talking with other consultants, talking with, you know, these design managers at, you know, huge corporations. And the one thing that they always kind of, you know, speak to or, or, or talk about is this act of practicing good design judgment. And we'll get in and kind of explain that a little bit further down in the presentation, but it, it is pretty self-explanatory. It's, it's basically how can you as an individual designer, you know, execute on what a client's asking you, right? Without having to ask too many questions or have them, you know, come along for the process too much. And I say that, and I might contradict myself later with some other comments, but basically it, it's something that you're always going to be working on. I'm constantly still working on, you know, practicing and, and learning what good design judgment is because it is ever evolving, um, you know, with new projects, with new challenges, uh, with new clients and, you know, new inspirations that you might get along the way. So it's taking all of those external influences and then again, through your own mind and through your own process, um, honing that down and coming up with that, you know, thoughtful design execution and, you know, using your good design judgment. So again, why process? So it gets you hired. <laughs> At the end of the day, process is you. It's your individual way of explaining your designs, your methodology. That's where the money is, right? Because anyone, not anyone, but a lot of people have skills, right? Anyone can throw something into Keyshot and make it look pretty. A lot of people can sketch or draw an idea or communicate it. But really at the end of the day, it's what is your process and how you come from point A to point B to C and D and then bring the client along for that journey, like I said, in a thoughtful way um, to where they feel that they're valued and that their opinions matter somewhat in the process. So these are all things that really are gonna set you apart from your competition. That's your classmates right now, right? That's really your competition at this stage. So, you know, when uh, you guys aren't in class, it's hard for me to <laughs> think about um, or, or talk to those terms, but uh, I guess if you have friends in your classes, you know, learn and understand what their skills are. Learn and understand how they're presenting projects. I assume you guys are doing Zoom meetings, so watch what they do and how they talk about things. Just take note of all those things along the way, because really that is your competition. When you guys graduate, 
you might be applying for the same job. So just be mindful of that. And I always like to kind of create a little competition amongst the studio, healthy competition, but I, I think it's good because it drives everyone forward and, and pushes you know, everyone in the class. So just be mindful of that. Um, so we said, and I mentioned thoughtful design. So I wanna kind of talk about that for a second, thoughtful design. So what are some words that we can use to describe this? Um, I don't know if any of you wanna unmute yourselves, but I can open it up really quickly to a couple of you guys if you wanna just shout out a couple of words. Anyone? No, see this is less interactive. <laughs> um, anyways, I'll go through, we, we wrote down a couple, harmony, right? Symmetry, balance, proportion, relationship and detail right these are all things that we kind of try to internalize when we go through our process and these are words that we try to obviously always maintain a cognition of so hey when we are doing certain things you know do they have these properties do they have these you know types of of you know aspects and 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 um, so forth so we can kind of take a look at a case study really quick and this is Basically, I'm trying to think of how to phrase this. This was, we, take a, we took a look at this a while back and we wanted to use this kind of as, uh, my old roommate was a psychologist, sorry, I guess I'll start there. He was a psychology major, got his master's in psychology. And I remember when I was working professionally, but it was maybe a couple years in, he was finishing up his master's. And he went through kind of some of these studies because he was studying it, you know, in his classes at that time. And so basically it's this, this psychological study that over the past few decades, um, they've done studies on what attracts us to each other. Um, and they found that certain innate characteristics are the driving force for how we kind of gauge beauty. And so, um, you know, some of these relevant characteristics, I think that we can at least kind of rationalize with design are youthfulness, symmetry, motion, uh, skin complexion, and now again, you're probably like, this is kind of weird. He's talking about, you know, human beauty um, and we're product designers. But I think that there is a relationship there because right in our innate, you know, animal instincts, right? We are attracted to things, right? We are attracted to other people. Um, and so basically I want to share this, this image with you. And this is basically some composites that an artist and a psychologist came up with. And it basically is comparing the Miss Universe delegates from the entire, you know, uh, there was 81 altogether. So basically they photoshopped all their faces together and you can look, they go kind of through, you know, continental kind of area as well. So Africa's, you have all of the, can, you know, delegates, then you have Europe, you have uh, Asia's, the finalists and the Americas. So clearly right at just a, at a very quick glance, they all look very similar, right? Um, and so basically this was just kind of a way for, for them to rationalize and kind of do a study on, you know, for the most part, what universal ideal beauty is. And, um, you know, just so you know, I'm not saying that this is the law of beauty, that this is, you know, any finite thing, but I do find this fascinating um, as we are wired, again, those innate characteristics, you know, wired into us um, that we find certain things more attractive than others. Um, and so it's just an easy way to, to you know, illustrate my point with that. Um, and, you know, the same goes for males, you know, it's, it's, it's all faces in general. This is just a study that, that we had found that, you know, relates these Miss Universe um, com uh, composites here. So again, right, further talking about what we find as attractive qualities or traits, which is, you know, we can really define them here and show with these kind of facial mask wire maps, which is symmetry, balance, and proportion. Um, and then I kind of want to bring that back towards, you know, what drives us towards beautiful objects. You know, now we can kind of use these ideals or that is just an illustration. Um, and so we have kind of, I guess, talked about the what and the why. So now I kind of want to talk about the who. So the who that we're going to speak about right here is Dieter Rams. And if you don't know who Dieter Rams is, um, you know, you kind of can't have a conversation about what good or thoughtful design is without mentioning Dieter Rams. Um, and he basically, um, you know, I guess I should rewind. I was introduced to his work um, by my boss at my internship. 
And actually, I, I didn't know who he was at that point. And so my punishment for not knowing who he was, um, was that I had to study and learn his 10 principles of design. And so we'll go through those in just a second. But again, uh, Dieter Rams is one of the most influential industrial designers of the last 50 years. Um, and he really was the driving force behind um, the German minimalist design movement. And his less but more approach pushed Braun to become the leading German consumer products company. Um, and it also inspired many of our current pop culture, you know, tech products that we are using this very moment. So clearly we can see a huge relationship here. Dieter Rams is on the bottom with his original Braun products. And then you have Johnny Ive on top with some of the Apple products. And I kind of just made this little right note, note to the left where right good design inspires. So take it as you may, you can say it's copying, you can say it, it is what it is, you know, make your own kind of thoughts and theories with it. But it, it's a really interesting theory that this approach to design this, you know, less but more approach in his design principles, which we'll go through next, really are a driving force for kind of this minimalist design. And again, kind of what we all, I think would agree is great design. So the 10 principles of design are as follows. We'll just kind of, I'm gonna mention all of them and there's a couple that I'll break out and kind of speak to specifically. So good design is innovative. Good design makes a product useful. Good design is aesthetic. Good design makes a product understandable. Good design is unobtrusive. Good design is honest. Good design is long lasting. Good design is thorough down to the last detail. Good design is environmentally friendly. And lastly, good design is as little design as possible. Okay, so I kind of picked my five favorites here and I'll kind of just read, you know, Dieter Ram's actual kind of quotation on, you know, each of these principles. So we'll talk about good design makes a product useful. So he says a product is bought to be used. It has to satisfy certain criteria, not only functional, but also psychological and aesthetic. Good design emphasizes the usefulness of a product whilst disregarding anything that could possibly detract from it. So if we move on to the next one, good design is aesthetic. The aesthetic quality of a product is integral to its usefulness because products we use every day affect our personal and our well-being, but only well-executed objects can be beautiful. Next one, good design makes a product understandable. It clarifies the product's structure. Better still, it can make the product talk. At best, it is self-explanatory. Moving on to the next, good design is honest. I like this one because I just really think it resonates and it should with you guys. So it does not make a product more innovative, powerful, or valuable than it really is. It does not attempt to manipulate the consumer with promises that cannot be kept. We'll get into that a little bit later. Um, and then lastly, good design is as little design as possible. So less but better, back to his, own, his, his main theory about design. Because it concentrates on the essential aspects and the products are not burdened with non-essentials. So basically his whole idea of back to purity, back to simplicity, right? I think some of us, and I've been guilty of this too, have lost our way a little bit. And I think there's been lately a lot of design that's become super, superfluous. I think that modern design is more at the forefront of everyone's vision, right? With all of, you know, these Instagram accounts, with all these Pinterest accounts and people pushing design, pushing design, pushing design. Design is much more popular now than it is even when I graduated. So you guys at least have that going for you. But at the same time, I think it could be a little bit of a detriment because everyone thinks they're a designer. Um, so you get sometimes in these meetings, I've experienced this many a times that you have too many cooks in the kitchen where every person that might be a sales guy thinks he's a designer. And that's just the nature of dealing with creatives and, and creative people that everyone always has something to say. So my, my advice to that as a little side note is that you always want to try to find, you know, the person who's the decision maker in the room and as best as you can talk to that person really try to hone in on what it is that they're asking, listen, right? Um, and and kind of coming back from that, that little tangent. So basically in summary with his design principles, it's to be thoughtful, right? I think these five that we highlighted and kind of brought out in red, 
it really, it really speaks to being thoughtful with your designs and with your executions. And with that, we're basically saying that good design is aesthetic. It is understandable. It's unobtrusive, it's thorough, and it's as little design as possible. So we should be concerned, we, we should be concerned with more than the superfluous details and adornments. Aesthetic and psychological attributes are critical to the user's experience and we must always design for the needs of the user. So that's something that I'm gonna segue into our process that again, it's really trying to focus on the user, right? The problems, what is the user's needs? And then that's what we're designing for. You know, and basically when I say that at the end of the day, as I just had mentioned, we're designing for the user, not ourselves, not some business executives, and really it's about the user. So um, basically we'll get into kind of our process a little bit, kind of create a little bit of this visual here to, to kind of speak to a couple of our, our points. And then we'll get into a couple of kind of case studies and we can illustrate a couple of things. I, I, I don't have time to get into our entire process, but we can show you a couple of hopefully just visually inspirational things. But we kind of break it down into compilation, exploration, generation, reformation, and execution. And with that, we kind of bring down some subtext. So compilation is your user insights. It's your competitive landscapes. It's your problem statement. Problem statement is very important. And I highly recommend you guys as students now should start to understand creating problem statements. You know, when you get into Max's, you know, senior studio class, that's absolutely what you're going to have to do, um, especially for your, your uh, SIP project, which is your thesis project. It's all about the problem statement. So you need to understand, again, the needs of the user. You need to understand the competitive landscape. You need to understand in the future what your client is asking you to do. What is the problem? You need to make that statement and get their sign off on that, basically. Then we segue into exploration. So this is, again, just looking at your product opportunities or your segment opportunities, the environment. So again, what are other products in there? You know, How can you potentially make impacts? What's technology that could help you out? Um, and then kind of your product experience that kind of blends the two of those. So really at the end of the day, your user is going to come back to your product experience and say, yes, this again, solved my problem. This, you know, filled my needs as a consumer. Then next we go to generation, which is your justification, right? Of that information that we just stated before. It's your concept development. And then it's a little bit of your proof of your concept. So that's all in your rough kind of ideation sketches. That's breadboard mock-ups, right? To prove if you have some sort of mechanism. So that's kind of this generation stage. Then we have reformation, which is the details. That's your production, that's your CMF. So this is kind of where the refinement of design comes is kind of in this reformation stage. So again, it's what are those details? What are those visual cues as to Dieter Ram said that products should almost be self-explanatory. So how can a user look at your product and say, I get it. I know how to use that product. I can pick it up. I can engage with that product. And it's, again, it's made me feel like I need this product. Um, and then we kind of go finally to execution, which is prototypes, you know, your several rounds of prototypes, you know, your final golden sample, your planning, your validation, which is obviously market testing um, and kind of all the back end follow through that you, you, you might do or you might not do. Um, so we've, we've done all of this. We've done segments of this. We've just done later parts of this. So it really depends when you get into the pressure world what your client needs and, and, and even no matter where you start in this process, um, you still need to kind of understand the problem statement. If they don't already have one, then you can still create a problem statement even if you're just testing you know, or doing CMF design. There's still a problem there. Hey, we realize that our consumers don't respond to bright, bold colors. Okay, that's a problem, right? How are we gonna solve that problem? So get in that mindset of starting to, even for yourselves, create a problem statement. I mean, again, that kind of ties into what I'm going to show you here in a second, but kind of highlighting these two sections, which is the exploration and the reformation stage. So obviously above you see, so in the exploration stage, that's kind of your imagination, right? That's where you really kind of get to play. No idea is a bad idea in your exploration stage. I remember one of my, uh, I guess, supervisors when I was at the Faulkner Design you know, Consultancy was that he said, no matter what you do, execute on every design that comes into your brain. So basically, 
even if you think it's a shitty idea and it's ugly as you start executing it, execute it, finish it. Otherwise that idea will fester in your mind. It's going to kind of still play tricks on you because you haven't gotten the thought fully out of your head. A little piece of advice for you guys there. And again, just really don't be so hard on yourselves, especially in that kind of imagination, you know, exploration stage. That's where you get to have fun. You get to play. In the realization stage, you know, that's where things need to become more real. You know, that's where you need to really think about the details, the CMF production, et cetera. And so then further highlighting design happens here. So that's in your generation and reformation stage. So again, it's from coming up with your initial concepts, which are actually solving the problem now. And then you go to your refinement stage, which is that reformation. And then at the end of it, right, we kind of flow through from left to right and then back from right to left. So basically at the bottom, it says your process story has to make a full circle. You always have to be able to say, we started at a problem. We went through all of our stages of exploration, refinement, et cetera, et cetera. We got to the end and then look, you can see this product traces back to our problem statement and we've solved a problem. Therefore, our consumer is going to desire this product and company, you paid us a lot of money to do this. So here you go. Um, and, and again, product, you know, statements will change and can change and scopes of project can change. So realistically, this is not going to be a beautiful shape. It's going to be something that might be all over the place, but every project is different. So just be mindful of that, you know, when you guys are in your own projects, but especially when you get out into the real world. And kind of taking a little bit of a closer look here at, you know, how I highlighted in green that design happens here. These are kind of a couple of things that we just try to remind ourselves and kind of just gave a couple of quick kind of images here that help illustrate it a little bit. So we kind of have primary, secondary, and tertiary responses to a product. This is what we say. So primary is your attraction, right, to the product. So that's things that have to deal with proportion, the form of a product, the stance of a product, right? If it's on a shelf, if it's on a floor, wherever the product might be, what is that initial reaction or attraction, I should say, in this primary stage. So be mindful of those types of things. In your secondary, this is kind of the inspection phase is what we call it. So right, you are looking at CMF, you are looking at tactile, you know, textures of a product, gloss, matte, any kind of a little textured kind of, you know, raised or debossed bump. Um, and then again, what is your response to that? And then finally, your tertiary, which is just the infatuation stage is what we call it. So that's the details, right? The little graphics, the discovery phases of, of picking up a product, right? So I would always say this, and I was told this when I was in the footwear industry, that um, basically with 100 shoes on a slat wall, if my shoe is somewhere on that wall and then the user, the consumer walks in and grabs my shoe off the wall first, I've won as a designer, right? I've engaged a user in picking up my product. They might not buy it. They might not eventually because of price or marketing or whatever else it is, they might not purchase the product. But in my mind and how I was taught that when they engage, if they engage with your product first, you've succeeded as a designer. Again, marketing teams, sales teams, I feel have more of that back end follow through for a, you know, a consumer to actually purchase the product. So again, be mindful of that. Um, and again, I, I think these are good ways to think about your refinement of design using some of these or come up with your own, right? Just kind of words or phrases that you can look at and say, okay, yeah, I or get opinions from your friends, et cetera, that, hey, what's your response to this? Hey, what do you feel about this CMF compared to that one? So that's all gonna factor into kind of your, um, your refinement stage, really. So that's kind of the end of the actual presentation. Um, and so what I wanna do now is, is go through kind of a couple of just projects. Again, I can't show you guys everything. Um, a, there's not enough time. And then B, it, it's just, I wanna show you guys just kind of some visual, um, hopefully that you guys think it's visually stimulating. Um, so let me escape out of this. Okay, so <clears throat> so this was a project that we had done for Epson, and this was taking a look at sustainability. And what they hired us to do was basically kind of create a presentation on sustainability, what that meant, and then how could we potentially use that idea of sustainability for some smartwatch design. So how can we implement that into the CMF of, of watch design? So 
again, kind of here's just some kind of overall general, you know, kind of information. We talked about kind of, I guess, what the problems were. They had already established kind of what they wanted us to do. So this was a little bit more of, a, of an execution, but we kind of wrote down some general not uh, not notations here. And then we kind of went through, we created these three different mindsets, right? So sartorial, this evolved rebel, and then this techno glam were these kind of driving buckets, so to speak, uh, of kind of aesthetic. Um, and this was from trend sites that we gathered this information and kind of our own right way of thinking about it. Um, so this is kind of how we created these initial three buckets to approach our, our, our CMF studies. So then again, here, these are broken down a little bit further. So with, you know, we talk about speed of adaption, sustainable types. So on top, right, right now, what is happening is this reincarnated, right? So where people are using composites, you know, you're getting wholesome uh, virgin materials repurposed, expanding their life cycle instead of just getting tossed in the trash, right? So plastics, metals, woods, rubber tires, there's a lot of repurposement going on, right, with materialization. And then kind of in the very near future, we talked about this vegan, you know, approach to products right? Let's be more, you know, less animal cruel. So alternative sustainable materials. So vegan leathers, not actual cow hides, um, based from plants, foods, dairy waste. So they're making leathers out of mushrooms. You know, there's a whole crazy new world of kind of materialization that's coming up from bio organic material, which you guys should absolutely be looking into as that's kind of what's, you know, really pushing forward some of the aesthetic and some of the products right now. And then for the future, we're really obviously in it, and it is already happening now, but we're really looking to grown, you know, materialization. So organism driven, you know, approach to materials, obviously 3D tech, uh, 3D printing technology and all kinds of other stuff that we know is kind of starting to become available now is only going to push just product design vastly, you know, ahead of its time. And so that's the really exciting kind of part right there. So Again, yeah, won't read all this, but this is like a look at those reincarnated materials, repurposed materials. So this is kind of a quick color study that we had done, kind of at a glance. Um, so renewed to give solid materials a playful look, highlighting colors through marbled layering and, and pulped finishes. So then here's kind of more material or detail kind of inspiration that we kind of you know put together for them. So again, plastic, marble, ceramics. Um, chipped or scattered, you know, terrazzo type of looking materials really kind of drive that aesthetic forward. And so here was, again, these are not designed. These are basically just quick ideas on how potentially they could use these materializations. So, you know, again, this was a quick project. Everything that you see here was maybe done in a week. You know, there was a refinement process that happened halfway through. Um, we showed them some initial kind of, again, ideas on how they could, you know, put together these materials and they liked some of them. They didn't like others. They wanted us to push further. So this is kind of where we, we ultimately kind of fell. Um, and they were, they were pretty happy with these results. Um, so I think they're, they're absolutely going to take this and push it on their smart, you know, watches as well as some of their, their lifestyle watches because Seiko Epson Corp is the company. So they have lifestyle watches as well. So then getting into the next one, vegan materials, again, kind of a overview there, looking at colors, naturally dyed, muted tones, um, understated neutral elegance, you know, kind of was a driving force behind this. Obviously, again, right, very organic, very natural looking neutral tones. And then here's kind of some of the material and kind of detail looks that, you know, we wanted to focus on. Again, now kind of highlighting getting into the product itself, right, using again, some of these natural, you know, really, you know, kind of approach to vegan, quote unquote, grown materials, recycled, repurposed, so to speak. And then lastly, is the grown materials, a little overview, taking a look again at kind of color inspiration where that's derived from materials, right? A lot of this stuff is grown, like we talked about, biofabricated materials using 3D printing technologies. Um, and so we kind of took a look at, you know, doing some really funky kind of stuff, you know, like this. And, and again, this was really more inspirational for them. You know, we're, again, we're, we're just trying to say, here's how you can potentially implement what these, these future, um, you know, ideas and themes, um, are. So that's kind of taking a look at that project right there. Close that guy out. And the next one, this was an apparel design project we had done. <clears throat> so Wadi Inc. is um, a triathlon specific company. And so they, uh, you know, deal with high performance, you know, endurance athletes. And so they want to come up with a, a workout apparel and style guide. 
So similar kind of thing. We, we came up with this kind of, you know, notion, and this was all phase one right here. This is just kind of our, our concepts and our thinking coming together with, with kind of the briefs that they gave us. Uh, we wanted to kind of create a categorization for the levels of basically products. So you have the alpha collection, the beta collection, then you have the omega collection. So again, one star, two star, three star, good, better, best kind of story. And so again, taking a look at kind of an inspirational kind of mood board to really kind of give this sense of what we call this urban attack. And so using a lot of obviously grays, blacks, whites, you know, very minimal approach to design and still kind of having that urban feel, right? Architectural in nature, um, little kind of details when you do zoom in, you know, materializations, the way to kind of combine things um, and more of this kind of, again, architectural kind of feel, but still having some performance. We didn't want it to look blocky and heavy. So again, zooming in, there's some certain, not that I'm zooming in here, sorry, but you know, you can see little areas of, of kind of detail um, using kind of perforated materials, you know, other types of, of you know, heat, um, gosh, sorry, I'm blanking right now, um, heat transfer, uh, types of, of applications for logos, um, you know, waterproof zippers, things that kind of create that a little bit more um, modern technical kind of look. And some jogger pants, hoodies, again with little details here and there, um, a little kind of collapsible, you know, lightweight kind of rain shell. Then looking at the next one we call was this burnt horizon. So trying to kind of use a little bit more of those colors in that palette, a little bit kind of more inspiration from that being visible, right, was kind of a theme with this collection. So there's, you know, uh, reflective, you know, heat transfers in key locations on the garments perforated, you know, on the backs here for breathability. Kind of just click through these pretty quick. And then this last collection was kind of the seafoam sprint that we called. Um, and again, using more kind of overstated, you know, but still clean kind of details and kind of color palette. So that was that. And then the last one, this is, this is kind of two PDFs I'm going to share with you guys. And it's kind of, a, I guess it was a two part project, but this was for Aspen medical. And basically what they tasked us to do initially was just to kind of come up with design inspiration. So, you know, a lot of times to our consultancy, they bring us in as kind of a hired gun. Um, just because of the way that we do deliver our, our, our presentations, you know, we don't sketch. Um, I'll show you a couple of other examples a little bit later, but we use Photoshop and Illustrator to create all of our concepts. We don't share a sketch with a client ever. Um, again, we just feel that there's more room for interpretation and kind of getting lost in translation that way. So we can give them a little bit more of a photorealistic image and something that, again, they can really hopefully get inspired not to say that right every concept is set in stone because we always tell them, hey, you know, whatever you like, we can pick and pull and we can Mr. Potato Head here and there. And doing that in Photoshop gives us a much faster turnaround for phase two, phase three, because it's already in the computer, right? We can change colors, add textures. We can do all those detail changes much quicker in the computer than we could if we had to be sketching everything and redo. So again, this was kind of just a compilation of just, just cool kind of imagery that we pulled from a, a couple of different sites, Les Manouche, um, uh, Pinterest, you know, uh, Instagram, you can find some things. Um, Car Design News has some stuff. There's just all over the internet. So I highly suggest to you guys that you start to just compile folders of just inspiration, just cool looking shit that, you know, you don't know what it might be used for, but it's just something that you can always reference and go, oh, well, that's a really cool kind of honeycomb texture on this outsole. Like, oh, I could use that on a backpack strap, whatever, I don't know. But so it just gives you a something always to kind of pull back to. And as again, in your presentations, it's always nice to give some sort of context before you kind of show just concepts right out of the blue. So clearly, obviously, your problem statements, other information, marketing, whatever other analysis is required, right, or whatever the deliverable is, but then always to have some sort of just beautiful imagery that can really set some context for, for your concepts and, and your designs. So just quickly click, clicking through this stuff. Um, again, a lot of it's performance-based, a lot of it's technical, 
but again, just really cool textures and materializations and patterns and just, right, just cool visually attractive stuff, colors. Um, so this is the really fun part, but I'm not gonna lie to you, this shit takes a lot of time. So don't like at the last minute go, oh, I need to whip up a visual image board for my project and I got 20 minutes, it ain't gonna happen. So that's why I say start now, look at things often, get your inspiration often, and, and, and really, you know, just start compiling folders. So you can see obviously that jacket was used on one of those other presentations you guys saw for the Wadi apparel. Again, motion, just cool things that kind of really reiterate and, and hone on some of those very initial kind of design kind of uh, themes that we had discussed um, with the psychology of, of design. So that's kind of that for that quick little inspirational journey there. And then we kind of used it for a little bit of guiding force for these neck braces that we designed with Aspen. And, you know, so basically I'm just gonna go through these and, and just kind of show you guys. But this was kind of a phase one concept here. And again, we just did orthographics, right? At, at phase one, it really just makes more sense, quicker, easier. Uh, and again, they know their own product, so they understand and can visualize what this product would look like wrapping around. So more organic approach to it, a lot more textural kind of giving visual, you know, um, cues to support, but flexibility. Textural details, you know, visual cues as to, hey, something happens here, right? The green strap, clearly, you know, there's a, a visual cue to grab that, to interact with it when the rest of the product is black. Again, giving some more direction and form and motion, sense of motion and support. So that was kind of phase one. This is kind of a phase two refinement. Um, and again, I'm not showing you all the little nuances and all the notations that we made. Just again, there's no time for that. Uh, but this is basically, they had a new kind of, you know, tightening mechanism. Um, so that's what changed kind of this whole kind of front end here. So we kind of took some inspiration or took cues from those earlier phase one concepts and then had to kind of rework and, and kind of re-engineer a little bit some of these other panels on the front of the collars. So... So that's kind of that. Again, just wanted to kind of click through those pretty quick for you guys. Um, again, just give you kind of some, some visual things to look at. Um, I don't know, I mean, I guess at this point, Max, do we want to do kind of Q&A? There's, there's, there's one or two other quick things I can show you guys um, if you want. Um, let's see. Yeah, we can go through another uh, couple of quick things if you'd like before we start Q&A. Perfect. So this is a little bit of our, I mean, this is what we send out to some potential clients that ask us for kind of a quick overview of, of what our capabilities are, what we do. You'll see some reiterations here um, of some of the information we went through. So again, this whole process matrix. So this is, again, these are just some projects. Again, kind of a quick overview of some things that we had done. So this is for Epson. This was a consumer inkjet uh, model that we had designed for them. Um, and so we did obviously market user trend research, design recommendations, and then 3D CAD. And this was actually part of a program that, again, they were using us to kind of push out their three to five year aesthetic, um, you know, kind of, kind of range. So we did this. Gosh, I think this is, yeah, maybe five years ago now. Um, so they actually have the, the printer released. I'll show it to you guys in just a second. Um, I got the photos after we had made this PDF presentation, but it actually won a, a good design award. So it was pretty cool to be a part of, of this project and, and was really fun to kind of go through some of the earlier rounds of iteration because they kind of just said, hey, you know, gloves are off, just design what you guys think would be cool. So really quickly, we wanted to kind of touch on some touch or textural kind of aspects to the printer, you know, creating that there's a difference from the top surfaces to the side surfaces. It's durable that you could put things on top of here. We have this really kind of light raised kind of bump texture up here, right? I think all of us put paper or other things on top of our printers. So we wanted to at least give people that visual cue that it was okay to do that. 
Um, but then again, just the really soft kind of, you know, nice curve and, and radius corners. Again, big visual cues as to, you know, put your finger behind here so you can lift that, that you know, screen portion up. Um, again, visual cues as a little rubber on a gloss surface to kind of drop that down for the paper tray, as you see here. So again, that was a great project. And that was one of the first products that, projects I worked on for Epson. Um, and that actually got us work for, gosh, the next five years. <laughs> so that was a pretty cool kind of thing to be a part of. Um, this was a, a concept for a business inkjet printer. So we had designed it as a, I'm sorry, we designed it as a consumer inkjet printer, but obviously right, much more aggressive styling, much more kind of heavy, you know, with these kind of chamfered edges. So they actually took this and used this as inspiration for one of their, their business printers, which is like a giant plotter. So that was actually kind of cool that, and this was actually one that we threw in after the fact. So kind of cool to see that they appreciated it so much that they used it as kind of a, an inspiration on, on another printer project. Um, this was kind of some head mount display kind of concepts we had created for them um, using right uh, um, augmented reality, you know, so factory workers, lifestyle, traveling, tourism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Malibu Sandals, this is a company that I've been with. This is a startup that we worked with from literally ground zero. They came to me with a, a, an Adilet, you know, Adidas slide when he ripped off the upper and he used stapled, you know, basically strips of, I don't even know what it was, like little foam styrene that he bought at, you know, Michael's or something like that. So we created this entire kind of brand language. We did all the tooling drawings for him, um, helped him with obviously a little bit of kind of marketing. Um, and so this is, is, a, is a company I'm still working with today. Uh, we have some new products coming out actually in the next couple months. Um, they're shipping from China. So really cool to kind of see that startup kind of grow from that sta uh, stapled together sample all the way into a, you know, a, a full-blown footwear company. Uh, Mophie, we have done some strategy and some prototyping for. So we've done stuff that's been shown to Apple, um, which is pretty cool. The higher up executives have, have seen prototypes that we've worked on for them. So that's always just kind of a feather in the cap and kind of a feel good moment. Um, this is another prototype that we had created for them. Um, and so I have a partner who has a shop. And so we, uh, we do some of these prototype projects together. And then it's Pearl Izumi. I'm a cyclist. And so this is one of my first amazing projects to be a part of. Um, this is, you know, TJ Van Garderen, pro rider, and this is in the Tour de France. So the shoe that I designed was worn in the Tour de France and there's just tons of photo documentation of it on the web. So uh, it was really cool. And they, you know, sent us a couple pairs of these. So I wore them for a bunch uh, of rides and, until, you know, years later when they just got too dirty and, and too beat up. So I had to retire them, but, but really, really cool uh, project that we worked on at Falker Design. Um, Pearl Zumi here, um, basically again, a running shoe with kind of a whole technology platform that we were designing, you know, into the midsole outsole, a uh, way to customize, you know, for specific runners, um, ask medical back braces, very more minimal approach. We've done some scoliosis brace development and design, um, neck, you know, kind of collars here. This is the very first round of some of the stuff that you guys saw. Um, they had some some uh, 3D prints made up to kind of test their their mechanisms, and then we styled it a bunch after that. Um, worked with micro mobility. This is one of those roller you know board you know suitcases so to speak. So obviously to get from point A to point B quickly in the airport when you're running late. Um, kind of a fun project and and something kind of uh, that we were actually going to be trying to license to a, a certain company. Um, I don't think that it ever went anywhere, but. You know, we're, we're, we're still potentially pursuing that. And then this was a micro scooter. So this is actually with a couple of partners. Um, and so basically this run a, won a Red Dot Design Award. Pretty cool project. Um, this is obviously now we're just getting into kind of some spec projects. So design some basketball shoes for Nike, more basketball shoes. Uh, we did plates, custom plates for, you know, football cleats, soccer um to those that are actual soccer fans um and so then we did some customizable footbeds and again these are all photoshop renderings that you're seeing here we did some apparel design different ways to kind of create perforations and laminating materials together that was kind of the whole exploration with these um, again laminating materials for different insulations on running vests and running jackets um, this was my first product that I actually got to go to China to actually develop, which was 
so crazy of an experience. We were there for just over two weeks. And so this is with company flow and, and my buddy at the time was working there. He was one of their developers. So that's kind of how the whole project kind of came about, but long story short, just, yeah, if you get a chance to go to China and be a part of a development process, uh, it's just incredible um, to see what and how, and, 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 you know, the iterations they go through to, to make a product. So highly educational. And, and I highly recommend if you guys get the opportunity, you, you should definitely do so. And a couple more kind of concepts and, and, you know, iterations. So real boot and then rendering under armor, some spec, you know, trekking, you know, technical boots that we had done for them, some military tactical stuff that we had done for them, some more uh, football cleats. Um, these were all spec, you know, just trying to do something way more aggressive. Right. And, and, you know, obviously this was phase one. So there's functional attributes that <laughs> definitely would need to be engineered here. But again, just trying to give some, some unique and, and interesting visuals uh, for that first phase to just kind of inspire and, and keep the conversation going. Harbinger, we did all kinds of workout, you know, elastic band handles and glove design for them. Um, and then this is actually, this is one of my, I guess, interns or one of my kind of, you know, uh, contractors that I'd used for a while there. This is one of his projects. Again, we just throw this in here for kind of 3D rendering and, and such. Um, and so that's kind of that in conclusion, kind of some of this other stuff that we've worked on. Obviously, there's tons and tons of projects. I mean, we've done everything. Again, like I said, apparel, footwear, consumer electronics, graphics, uh, the design research. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's all over the board. And so again, if you guys, you know, have a particular skill set or have a particular industry you want to get into, I, I recommend now that you start and work towards that goal. Um, you know, again, I didn't know I wanted to be a footwear designer until I, I saw that email come for that internship opportunity. And, and, and honestly, that, that one week I had to use my buddy's Wacom tablet and to kind of put together some, some renderings, um, that, that was the start of, of my career was right then and there. And, and I fell in love with it. Um, the design of the, of the product is awesome. It's a faster turnaround time. Um, it's something right. You can see on the street, you know, for years to come after you design the product. And so for me, that's what I wanted to do. And I, I immersed myself in it. I mean, like I said, I, I worked my ass off to kind of understand the industry, to understand what we were doing in our process at Faulkner design and, and to get better and hone my skills. So whatever it is for you guys, I just recommend that you start now, you know, um, and basically kind of to close it all out is just reiterating that your process is your most defining attribute. You know, that's, again, that's what's going to get you the job. Um, so start to define it now, you know, and again, it's going to change. It absolutely is going to change. Mine has changed. Absolutely. It's probably going to change in, in the next couple of years as well. Um, you know, so it, it, it's, that's the refinement of yourself, I guess. And, and finally, in conclusion, I would just say like, that's the refinement of design. So hope you guys enjoyed it. Appreciate it.